Good evening. I'm Joe Nye. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the ARCO Forum. Uh, we have, as you see, an overflow crowd. There is, in room 140 behind there, uh, a that will be uh, broadcast into 140, so if you're standing and want to sit, uh, there still are spaces in room 140. We're very pleased tonight to have a forum on the crisis of global capitalism, uh, and we're delighted to have the return of George Soros to the Kennedy School. George is the chairman of Soros Fund Management and, most important, author of the newly published book, The Crisis of Global Capitalism, Open Society in Danger. George Soros was born in Budapest in 1930 and endured both Nazism and Communism before emigrating to Britain in 1947. There he attended the London School of Economics where he studied under the great philosopher Karl Popper and had a, a strong seminal uh, influence on Soros. After graduation from LSE in 1951, he joined a banking firm and he emigrated to the United States in 1956 and started, among other things, the Quantum Fund and has made a fortune. But he wasn't <laughs> happy simply to make a fortune. He was also interested in trying to do something good for the world. And he started his first foundation in 1979, giving it the name that Karl Popper would have admired the Open Society Fund. And he currently administers nonprofit foundations and organizations in over 30 countries around the world, promoting the expansion of civil liberties, free press, and religious pluralism. His work in promoting democracy in Eastern Europe has been particularly notable. He's become a model for other benefactors. For example, when Ted Turner pledged a billion dollars to the United Nations, he cited George Soros as the philanthropist he most admired. He's also the author of a number of articles and five books, including the latest work, which is the subject of his discussion with us tonight. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, having read it over the weekend, it's well worth reading. He will be followed by Jeffrey Sachs and Danny Roderick, uh, the faculty here. Uh, Jeff Sachs is the Galen Stone professor, uh, professor of International Trade and director of the new Center for International Development at the Kennedy School and of the Harvard Institute for International Development, and uh, author most recently of Macroeconomics in the Global Economy with Philippe Lorraine. Uh, Danny Roderick is the Rafi Kariri Professor of International Economy, has published widely in the areas of international economics, economic development, and political economy. One of his books, whose title tells a lot, but I also enjoyed reading, was How Has Globalization Gone Too Far? Uh, he's associated with a number of important organizations, including the National Bureau of Economic Research, and we're looking forward to hearing both Jeff and Danny. But first and most important, we're interested in hearing from you, George. Welcome back. Okay. Okay. Well, I have actually got some prepared remarks, which is not <coughs> my usual style, but since I have very little time and I've got a lot to say, uh, I thought I would try to uh, be uh, sort of concise, uh, because uh, the, the, I've crowded an awful lot in, into the book, my entire view of the world, and since the world is a very complicated place, the book uh, covers an awful lot of territory. But the basic ideas uh, are really uh, quite simple, uh, self-consistent, and consistent with the, with the evidence, uh, so much so that they are often uh, dismissed as uh, 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 belaboring the obvious. Uh, yet those ideas have uh, implications which are very far-reaching. Uh, my conceptual framework is built on the twin concepts of fallibility and reflexivity. By fallibility, I mean that our understanding of the world in which we live uh, can't qualify as knowledge. By reflexivity, I mean that there is a two-way uh, connection between our thinking and the situation in which we participate. On the one hand, we try to understand 
understand it, that's the cognitive function. On the other hand, our actions shape the world in which we live, and that's the participating function. Now, each function on its own yields determinate results, but the in interplay between the two introduces an element of indeterminacy both into people's decisions and into the course of events. Now, fallibility, all this may sound like platitudes, but they have far-reaching implications, which are anything but generally accepted. You are all familiar with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in quantum physics. The uncertainty principle, which I'm proposing for the social sciences, goes a step further, because the, the behavior of quantum particles remains the same, whether Heisenberg's principle is accepted or not. But in human affairs, the subject matter is affected by the theories which, we, which relate to them. History has been affected by Marxist theory of history, and financial markets have been affected by the theory which holds that markets tend towards equilibrium. And this constitutes an element of uncertainty which is missing in the natural sciences. Now, the radical uncertainty principle which I'm proposing is difficult to accept and even more difficult uh, to work with. A great deal of effort has, gone, has been expended throughout history in trying to deny it, often with disastrous consequences, because denying it means distorting reality, and a distorted view of reality can be imposed only by denying people the freedom to think for themselves and creating an open, uh, closed society. By contrast, the acceptance of our fallibility leads to the concept of an open society in which nobody is in possession of the ultimate truth, perfection is beyond our reach, and we must content ourselves with the second best, an imperfect society which is open to improvement, and that is the concept of open society. Now, I can't possibly deal with all the ideas contained in the book, uh, so uh, otherwise I wouldn't have written the book. Uh, I should like to take advantage of the presence of two, uh, two eminent uh, uh, economists uh, to focus on my critique of economic theory. Uh, I want to make two uh, fundamental points. First, the concept of equilibrium is very misleading when it is applied to financial markets and macroeconomic problems. Economic uh, equilibrium is a useful concept when markets deal with known quantities. But financial markets don't deal with known quantities. They try to discount a future which is contingent on how financial markets discount it at present. As a consequence, the future cannot be known. And the bias expressed in the market participants' decisions becomes an important factor in determining the course of events. To describe financial markets in term, terms of equilibrium implies that outcomes correspond to expectations, and that is not the case. In reality, there is a lack of correspondence because the outcome is not something determinate to which expectations could correspond. The lack of correspondence usually finds expression, expression in a divergence between expectations and outcomes. And even in the limiting case, when the two happen to coincide, the correspondence may be brought about by the participating faction, function, that is to say, the effect of the participant's bias on the future course of events, rather than the cognitive function, namely the ability of the participants to anticipate the future correctly. Financial markets are best understood in terms of reflexivity. There are times when the participants' bias is self-correcting and markets exhibit a tendency towards equilibrium. But at other times, the bias is self-reinforcing until it becomes unsustainable. Uh, and on these occasions, markets exhibit a boom-bust pattern. <coughs> the trouble with reflexivity is that the outcome is not only unpredictable, but genuinely indeterminate. By contrast, equilibrium produces, it, produces a determinate result. However widely a pendulum may swing, uh, 
it always comes to rest at the same point. That is why economic theory uses the, the concept of equilibrium. Unfortunately, the analogy with the pendulum is false. As we have seen recently, financial markets can sometimes uh, behave more like wrecking balls, knocking over one economy after another. In my book, I apply my analysis to the global capitalist system, and I contend that it suffers from some glaring deficiencies. There is a significant imbalance between the center, which provides capital, and the periphery, which is in need of capital, and this imbalance has been reinforced by the current financial crisis. This is a topic which I'm sure we will return to in the course of the discussion. My other main point relates to values. Economic theory takes values as given. In other words, it assumes that people know what they want. This assumption is necessary for economic theory to reach deterministic conclusions, but is not necessarily true. In reality, values are not a matter of knowledge, and people don't know what they want, often don't know what they want. In effect, values are reflexive. On the one hand, they are influenced by the society in which we live. On the other hand, people's values shape the character of their society. The excessive emphasis on market values, which characterizes our society, is, in my opinion, a dangerous distortion of what ought to be an open society. Here, I'm criticizing not so much economic theory, but the misuse of economic theory for political purposes. I'm attacking what is used to be called, or what I used to call, the laissez-faire ideology. But now I have found a better word, name, word for it. I call it market fundamentalism. <laughs> I contend that at the present moment in history, market fundamentalism constitutes a bigger danger to open society than socialism. Because socialism has been discredited, whereas market fundamentalism is triumphant. Market values express what one participant is willing to pay another in a free exchange. They do not reflect social values, nor do they express many of the intrinsic values that, that people hold dear, because those values don't involve the exchange of goods and services. Those values must find expression in political, social, and individual actions, which are not necessarily economic in their motivation. Unfortunately, collective decision-making as practiced in a representative democracy is much less efficient than individual decision-making as practiced in markets, especially where economic issues are concerned. The government is very inefficient as an economic agent, and this has made government interference in the economy very unpopular. Market fundamentalists have tried to explo exploit this sentiment by claiming that the common interest is best served by everybody looking out for his own interests. This claim is false. The argument would have greater merit if markets tended towards equilibrium, but even then it would not be valid. There are many political and social objectives which are not properly served by the market mechanism because they do not involve a free exchange between individual participants. These include the preservation of competition and the preservation of stability in financial markets, not to mention issues like the environment and social justice. An important distinguishing feature of markets is that they are amoral. In an efficient market, no individual participant can affect the outcome because there is always another participant to take his place at only a marginally different price. So participants don't need to worry about the social consequences of their actions. But society can't function without some sense of morality, some agreement on what is right and what is wrong. By promoting market values into a governing principle, market, fundamental, market fundamentalism has undermined our society. Representative democracy presupposes some moral values, such as honesty and integrity, particularly in our representatives. When success takes precedence over integrity and politics is dominated by money, 
the political process deteriorates, fueling the resentment against politics and government in general in a self-reinforcing process. The situation is even worse when we look at the world at large. We now have a truly global economy with a great deal of interdependence, but no global society and not much agreement on shared values. I believe that these arrangements are both financially and politically unstable and in the long run unsustainable. I don't advoc advocate abolishing the global capitalist system. I propose making it more stable and equitable. We must, <coughs> we must start by distinguishing between market values and intrinsic values. As competitors, our goal is to make money. But as human beings, we must be concerned about what kind of society we live in, what kind of rules we compete by. Unfortunately, competition has become so fierce that the need to succeed has swamped our concern with the common good. This is a disease of our contemporary society fostered by the rules of global capitalism, and these rules need to be changed. The initiative must come from those people and those countries which have been successful in the global competition. Now, it will be objected that I'm advocating something unrealistic. Why should one be concerned with the common good when others are not? Uh, my proposal seems to run afoul of the so-called free rider problem. But this objection is not well founded. It fails to distinguish between rulemaking and competing by the rules. I'm not proposing that we should stop competing, and it is only when we compete that the free rider problem arises. When it comes to rulemaking, we should not be deterred by free riders from doing the right thing, provided we truly believe in doing the right thing. As, compet as competitors, we must fight to win. As human beings, we must be prepared to fight for, for some intrinsic values such as freedom and justice, even if it means fighting for a lost cause. That is what I believe in, and that is what I practice both in my book and in my life. Thank you. Jeff. Uh, Danny. Was Our first. Danny's first? Yeah. Okay, Danny, you're up okay. there. Um, sit over from here. I think we, yeah, the mics are, should be set up for you to sit still. That's right. Well, it, it, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, George Soros uh, to the Kennedy School. Um, uh, I, I, he's, a, he's a breath of fresh air, um, even though for an economist, um, as he um, keeps, uh, keeps criticizing us, he can also, also uh, um, be uh, occasionally um, a, a, a source of um, discomfort. Um, um, as, as Joe said, uh, Mr. Soros is, is a man of great eminence in the worlds of finance and uh, of philanthropy, um, and he's also turned out to be a, a, a very effective critic of uh, the international economic system, as well as a, a very vocal crit uh, critic of, of economics uh, generally. Um, I, I, it's in, in, when you think about it, the, the combination of attributes uh, that he collects in his person is such Im so implausible that if you were to think, if, if, Mr. if George Soros didn't exist, would anyone would be smart enough to actually invent him? Um, and I think it's, it's highly unlikely. Um, it's, uh, but that, that would really be a, a quite a pity. Um, there are many, many impressive things about, uh, about George Soros. Um, one of the most impressive, I find, is that uh, um, as far as I know, he's the only person in the world who's, who's managed to uh, find sound investment advice uh, in the teachings of some long dead uh, continental European philosophers um, with names that typically start with Carl for some reason. <laughs> um, um, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it apparently works very well for him, but uh, as they say, don't try it at home. Uh, <laughs> The other thing that's great about him, of course, is that when, 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 Mark, when he says markets are inherently unstable, uh, the usual retort doesn't work. The usual retort is, how do you know? Um, well, um, this, he knows because he is the market. Um, <laughs> now, 
many, many academic economists uh, really scoff at his ideas. In fact, just this morning I had the experience that I was talking to a colleague in the economics department, and I told him that uh, I had been reading Soros's new book. Um, and the first question he asked me was, I have to report, uh, well, how nutty is it? Um, I, I thought about this for a while. I had to think for a while because I have an academic reputation to defend. Um, so, and my response was uh, not as nutty, not nearly as nutty as I had thought his Atlantic Monthly piece of February 1997 um, was. So I have to admit that when I first read that piece in Atlantic Monthly, uh, which is now almost two years old, um, I was... Um, baffled, unconvinced, um, and quite skeptical. Uh, but it's really quite amazing what a difference two years have made. Um, it's not that he has changed his mind. Uh, what has happened is that since February of 1997, uh, financial markets have brought East Asia and R Russia um, uh, crushing down. And for a while, it looked like the same might happen in Latin America. Um, the instability in world financial markets, and more to the point, the, the costs of such instability um, have become all too clear uh, to the rest of us. As I read him, I think the, the central message that I take is that um, global capitalism cannot survive uh, in the absence of what he calls a, a global society. Uh, what is a global society? Uh, I think what he means is a set of political and legal institutions that regulate and stabilize international markets in the same way that domestic markets are governed by a range of regulatory agencies, a central bank, and I would add institutions that redistribute risk and provide social insurance. Uh, I'm completely in agreement uh, with this position. Uh, my questions are about where we go from here. First question is, can we really have a global society without some form of global federalism? Um, George Soros recognizes that national sovereignty will not disappear overnight, uh, but he also believes that uh, it, um, states should be subordinate to international law and to international institutions. Um, we can quibble about terminology, but I think um, when you think about what this means, it sounds awfully uh, close to global federalism to me. Uh, second is, is global federalism or whatever else one might want to call the subordination of national states to international law and international institutions really feasible? Uh, again, the answer seems to me to be negative. In fact, as, as George Soros notes in his book, uh, that the country that is least willing to subordinate itself in this fashion is the country that has pushed the gospel of market fundamentalism the most, uh, that is the United States. And third, even if global federalism were feasible? Would it be desirable? Once again, I would answer negatively. Um, the existence of global federalism presupposes a certain amount of convergence among nations in their institutions, in their norms, in their social arrangements more broadly. After all, if nations are going to be subordinate to international law and institutions, we have to ask whose laws and whose institutions will these global, global ones look like? I think today's advanced industrial nations uh, are alike in a lot of different respects, in their respect for private property, in the rule of law, in the importance placed on private price stability, but they also diverge greatly in their approach to a whole range of other institutional choices in, with respect to social insurance, with respect to the organization of labor markets, with respect to corporate governance, with respect to regulation of product markets, the extent of redistributive taxation, and the intrusiveness of their governments in the economy more broadly. I would say that there are probably almost as many working models of successful capitalism as there are advanced industrial countries. And I see no reason to expect that convergence, the kind of convergence that you would need to have this global institutional infrastructure, um, that kind of convergence would be intrinsically desirable, even if feasible. Which leads me to the uh, most difficult question uh, of all, I think, um, if global society, using George Soros's term, is neither feasible nor, when it comes down to it, really desirable, what does that mean for global capitalism? What it means, perhaps, is that global capitalism is not really attainable and that we should content ourselves with a world economic system built around national capitalisms. Perhaps we should have a minimalist set of international rules, the objective of which is to maintain international economic stability rather than ensure open economic borders at all costs. 
Now, this is a vision that is very different from the one that's inherent in the idea of a global society. But I wonder if it is not the real message to be taken from this fascinating book. Let me just add a couple of words on the notion, on the criticism of economics and the notion of, of equilibrium. Um, I think most of the issues here are actually terminological. Um, many of the inefficiencies in the operation of international financial market, um, which, um, which uh, George Soros discusses, are actually things that have been uh, studied and analyzed in, in quite a rich economics literature. Things like excess volatility, boom and bust cycles, um, the existence of buzz, bubbles, there is a, um, a very f um, full range of, of um, uh, economic models that actually um, uh, generate these kinds of pathologies. So they're not new to the economics and, and finance literature. Um, and I think our, uh, the, the, the stand one would take as to the likelihood of these kinds of outcomes are not determined within the rules of economic reasoning per se, but are much more the function of one's own ideologies or uh, to put it in George Soros' terms, how much one has already bought into the market fundamentalism uh, idea. But I think that shouldn't really dis distract us from what I take to be the, um, um, the, 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 the force of, of uh, in this book and in George Soros' arguments, um, the, the, the critique of market fundamentalism, which is very well placed, the importance of underlying, underlining this, the, these institutional backing and underpinning that, that markets need uh, on, not only nationally, but also globally, and I think he's done us all a great service. Make sure you read the book. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Jeff? I knew I was right to let uh, Danny go first and defend our honor, uh, as he did uh, so eloquently. Uh, and in any event, uh, George, you won't find uh, you won't find uh, quarrels from economists, at least at this end of the campus. Uh, maybe uh, some of our fundamentalists uh, in the economics department may, may differ. But the notion that markets are unstable, that they have multiple equilibria, if you uh, use uh, the terminology that we're uh, more uh, prone to use, uh, is uh, very consistent with your view. There's no doubt been some reflexivity or transitivity uh, uh, in uh, your lessons for us uh, and, uh, and so on. But I think uh, many of us are painfully aware of how unstable international markets are and how much damage they can do, and indeed how much damage was done in the past year. You pose a big question. We've already gone uh, soaring into the stratosphere uh, in terms of uh, the future uh, shape of the world. I guess I'll stay up at the stratosphere and uh, also uh, think uh, big or, or muse aloud uh, on, uh, on big themes for a couple of, uh, a couple of minutes. I guess the first question uh, that I would ask myself is whether we are really in a system of capitalism at the core of the system, uh, and that is the rich countries. Uh, and my guess is that we are not, that we don't live in an intrinsically unstable uh, country or an unstable national economy or an unstable advanced world economy. Uh, we have cycles, uh, we have crises, we've had one Great Depression in the last 150 years. It was extraordinary as an outlier, despite all the fears that uh, we've never come close to uh, anything like that again. In my view, the crisis of global capitalism is a crisis of the periphery, not the core. But I think periphery, uh, as I endlessly like to say, is, uh, is a very misguided term, given that 85% of the world is the so-called periphery. Uh, and uh, only 15% of the world lives in the advanced industrial economies. We have in front of us the largest gaps in income between rich and poor in the history of the world. And that, I think, is a crisis. What is uh, deeply true is that we have no reliable mechanisms in place that are leading to a narrowing of those gaps or a steady, sustainable, reliable increase in the living standards of the poorer countries. To give you some measure of this, the 15% of the world that's us uh, in the advanced economies <coughs> have an average income now of about $25,000 per person, whereas the 85% in the so-called periphery, which is the world, uh, aside from this uh, narrow uh, 
strip of uh, good temperate zone that we live in uh, is uh, averaging about $1,200 per person, of, or in other words, a gap of about 20 to 1 in income levels. If you correct for differences in purchasing power, it's maybe 7 to 1 rather than 20 to 1, but the gap is widening, not narrowing. What I take to be one of the two great crises of the world uh, of global capitalism is the crisis of our inability to even care enough to fashion a system that reliably is allowing the rest of the world to make some progress in narrowing the gaps and to reliably make benefit of the most stupendous increase of scientific and technological knowledge that the world has ever produced in a short period of time to narrow the gaps. I don't think we're there by a long shot, and I think that the so-called Washington consensus that's been fashioned uh, in the last 10 years has failed uh, to think hard about this issue and failed to produce results. And that I take to be the crisis of global capitalism uh, in its deepest sense. Not crises at the center either in our political or economic system, maybe I'm too optimistic, but crises in the rest of the world where uh, the uh, quality of life uh, is, would be unrecognizable to, to most Americans and where things are getting worse, not better. So the question that I would ask is why that's the case. Uh, why uh, the international system, with a pretty benign hegemonic uh, US power, has not done better in fashioning an environment in which the poor countries can thrive. And I think that this is the issue that really requires the deepest kind of analysis. On one point, uh, the first that I'd mention, I find the book uh, thoroughly uh, satisfying, and I uh, not only agree with it, but uh, have uh, felt very much over the years that this is uh, the essence uh, of the financial problem, and that is that the international financial rules of the game do not promote stable and reliable flows of capital from rich to poor and for a lot of the reasons that uh, George Soros has said, although I would add that it's not just intrinsic instabilities in the rules of the game, but how our international institutions, ranging from 15th Street to 19th Street in Washington, actually function, because the IMF tends to make things a lot worse rather than better uh, in the international system, and this is a very serious crisis of global governance, one that <coughs> people have a very hard time accepting no matter how many times we see deep screw-ups in the system, as we've seen in the last two years. But they weren't the first, and they won't be the last. And no matter how many times the IMF fails in Russia, we send back the very same team to negotiate the very same failures. And it's, to me, one of the most mind-boggling uh, aspects of the whole international scene. It remains, uh, it, it remains the, uh, the, the uh, Teflon institution par excellence uh, nothing sticks, no matter how bad uh, it, its uh, policy advice has been. Now, what is wrong with the international environment? I think George has it right. This reflexivity or multiple equilibria means that bad things can happen to good countries. Uh, if there becomes a sense of panic, the panic can feed on itself. Last summer, a year and a half ago, I believed that if the IMF did what it said it was going to do, it was going to create panic rather than ameliorate it in Asia. And sure enough, something went wrong with the IMF's forecast of 3% growth. They turned out to, minus, to be minus 15% GNP in Indonesia and minus 10% in Korea and Thailand. I'll give you a rule of thumb from economics. If you can't predict GNP within 12 percentage points in a 12-month period, something's wrong with your model. Uh, and uh, we, we, have a, uh, we have a very, very serious failure of thinking in Washington, which doesn't get better because no one wants to admit it. Uh, and uh, it's one of the most regrettable aspects of uh, the world situation. There's a second problem that's even deeper and even less analyzed, and that is that most of the world faces some deeply intrinsic difficulties to development that we just don't understand. There are no poor countries, I'm sorry, there are no rich countries in the tropics besides two little specks 
uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, with all due respect, they're not the people on them, but the rocks that the, the people live on. Uh, all of the rest of the tropics are poor, and all of the poor countries in the world, all of them that have per capita income of $2,000 or less, are in the tropics. I emphasize this because there is growing and I think overwhelming evidence that agricultural productivity, infectious disease, and other intrinsic burdens of living in the tropical ecozones is such a punishment to modern economic growth that we simply don't have a working model to overcome the poverty in that region. So I would say we barely think about this problem. We send teams to reform the civil service over and over again while 800 million people contract malaria every year. And instead of spending on malaria, we spend billions of dollars to run the IMF and the World Bank and spend about $80 million <coughs> a year to work on malaria vaccines. So this is really messed up. And it's because no one's thinking very hard about what the real problems of the poor countries are. The third problem I would stress is that poverty feeds on itself through predatory government. And when you start off with huge disabilities of massive burdens of infectious disease and incredibly low agricultural productivity that is intrinsic to a lot of these difficult regions, you have the kind of weakness of civil society and impoverishment which allows governments to predate, to be predatory on their own people. So we have two kinds of political problems, a global political problem and a domestic political problem sandwiched in between some very, very deep and unsolved burdens of disease and agriculture that have left more than two and a half billion people in the world desperately poor and not getting any better by any of the nostrums coming out of Washington right now. And that is how I would summarize the global capitalist crisis. I think it is severe, and I think it's likely to get worse. I said that there were two crises. The other is that we're relentlessly destroying our own environment and through impoverishment and massive growth of population in these fragile environments that I've been speaking about. The poor are further destroying their own environments at a rate that I think everybody appreciates is horrifying, but that we put aside in our normal uh, lives. I just came back from touring the damage of Hurricane Mitch uh, in uh, Central America. And of course, this is a natural disaster, but one where almost all of the loss of human life is a political and social human-made disaster of populations living on treacherous cliffs, living in floodplains, uh, living in rivers uh, where people drown in the middle of the night because they lived at the base of uh, ravines where they couldn't escape. The poor died, not the rich, uh, and this was a, uh, a social, uh, socially uh, created disaster. The winds came from nature, but the deaths came from society. Uh, and we don't uh, deal with these problems adequately as well. Let me stop with one concrete suggestion. The world is never going to get fixed as long as the G7 countries engage in a dialogue of their own and once a year pontificate for the world where countries that represent 12% of the population <coughs> presume to speak for the world. In the latest G7 document two weeks ago about the global financial system, there's actually an incredible line that says, we should consult broadly so that the rest of the world buys into these concepts. It's really right there. The idea that you might consult with the rest of the world to discuss the concepts isn't even mentioned. So I believe that just like we don't expect our government beneficently to bestow freedom upon us, that we know that's a struggle of open society and civil society from below. I don't believe that the <coughs> developing world should sit by while the G7 figures out everything for them and expects that at these great annual meetings or at the executive committees of the IMF, where the G7 has a 55% vote and besides everything is determined between, literally between 15th Street and 19th Street with an occasional call to Whitehall, that we can really expect that the state of the world is going to be improved. At a minimum, I think we should be done with the G8 as it's now called, 
At a minimum, I would like to see a G16 very much in line with what George Soros calls for, and that is a committed group of countries committed to the open society. My G G16 would be eight developed and eight democratic developing countries that sit down and talk about the world really as it is. And that's a world of great inequality and a world in which the poor overwhelmingly outnumber the rich. Thanks. <laughs> we, now, we now have uh, 15 or 20 minutes for questions. There are two microphones on the floor here, two in the balcony. We'll take the question, Siri Adam at the mics. And let me remind you that the ground rules are questions are brief, end with it a question mark, and come one per customer. <laughs> with three parts. Yes. Um, uh, please identify yourself so Mr. Soros or the other panelists know who, who you are. Okay, my name is Elizabeth Burko, and I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. I'm curious because in this entire discussion, there's been no real mention of the role of capital flows in this uh, crisis of global capitalism. And given that Mr. Soros heads the Quantum Fund, I'd be curious if he could talk a little bit about how he talks, uh, sort of reconcile what I see as sort of this, this disequilibrium between a global society, as you put it, and the role of hedge funds, i.e. hot capital money, on the instability of these markets? <coughs> yes, uh, uh, there's no question that, that, uh, that uh, if you leave capital flows purely to the market, you get these boom-bust uh, sequences. Either you, you have uh, you know, uh, exuberance or you have panic. Uh, and that is my argument that, in fact, the the capital markets are really not very good in the international distribution of, of, of capital because they either supply too much or, or, or too little. Uh, now, uh, I am part of that. And uh, if I uh, fought the market, uh, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be where I am. In other words, market participants play by uh, the rules that prevail. And uh, it's, as a general rule, uh, if you uh, try to go against the herd, you get uh, trampled. So uh, if you want to be successful, you try to be ahead of the herd, but never against it. Uh, so, uh, so this is entirely my argument that you need, uh, that if markets are inherently unstable, then imposing market discipline on national economies, you are imposing instability on society. And how much instability can the countries in the periphery, which are dependent on the international flow of capital? Because I think Jeff was very right in emphasizing that it is a, a, a crisis at the periphery uh, rather than at the center. Yes. Jose Gerstl from the Business School. Um, I have a takeaway right now that we are in deep trouble with this uh, managed poverty problem in the world. And with the? The managed poverty in the world of this. Uh, managed currency? Managed poverty. poverty. Ma managed poverty. I see that this is my takeaway that uh, capitalism is dealing with a problem of managed poverty. We have a lot of poor people and a few that have a lot of economic power. So my question is. In your assessment, which is the how to change this economic model we call capitalism? Which are the key components? And I would like to hear from each one of you three or two things that maybe will be important for me. Okay. You, you want to start? No. Which no. one? <laughs> You're the guest, George. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Obviously, if the, if the, if the uh, financial markets and the, uh, uh, the international banking system is not very good at, uh, uh, at providing the adequate flow of capital, you need a system which encourages it. 
you know, there's been a lot of talk about now of uh, moral hazard and so on, uh, uh, which has led to excessive lending. There is some merit in those arguments, but you now have a situation where capital is fleeing uh, the periphery. And you could introduce a system, uh, you could introduce what I propose, a, a, a credit uh, guarantee arrangement uh, to provide capital to countries which are following sound economic policies, both macro and uh, structural, but uh, don't have an adequate supply of oxygen, of, of, of money. Uh, and uh, th that would make uh, money available to them, and it, it by then uh, uh, not, let's say, withdrawing that facility when at, at, at times of overheating, you would be able to, to, to avoid the excesses of both um, undersupply and, and oversupply. So that is, I would say, um, uh, the, the core of my, of my uh, proposal. Uh, I also think that, that the countries concerned need a sound banking system. And by uh, making such, channeling such uh, 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 guarantees through banks, those banks would need to be uh, supervised. Uh, they, they would have to meet certain standards. So I, uh, I agree with Danny Roderick that I'm actually not advocating world federalism. But if you have a voluntary uh, arrangement where countries benefit from uh, uh, an inflow of capital, they would also presumably accept uh, proper supervision of their banking system. It would be voluntary and not imposed. So that would be my solution. Danny will give you the one-minute solution to capitalism, and then Jeff the one-minute solution. Well, uh, first, um, first uh, we have to recognize that, that capitalism still remains the only way which we know how to generate wealth. So there's, there's no alternative to it. But that doesn't mean that, that, that capitalism is just one thing. I think what we've been, we have been reforming capitalism for the last two centuries, ever since it began. Capitalism, the way that capitalism started out in, in, in Britain and the way that it looks now in the advanced industrial countries <coughs> are two very different animals, just starting with the enfranchisement of labor, the, uh, the um, um, uh, sort of making education more widely available, then the post-war period, uh, this, the social insurance and, and the, the uh, expansion of safety nets. These are all uh, innovations to, um, to making capitalism both do what it does best, which is to generate, um, generate wealth, but also to, to take care of, of the uncertainties and those who may not be otherwise be uh, well served in, in the market. And I, we, we keep reinventing capitalism, and I think, I think that's the way that, uh, that we, have to, we have to keep thinking of it. Jeff? Uh, One minute. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> three proposals, 20 seconds each. Uh, A, stabilize capital flows by limiting short-term capital movements and maintaining flexible rather than pegged exchange rates, which are a trigger of these crises. Two, close down, privatize the World Bank, close down the IMF, uh, and uh, <laughs> you use the money to address the truly deep scientific issues of, uh, of tropical ecology, disease ecology, uh, agricultural productivity, which are at the heart of the poverty of most of the very poor in the world. And three, in politics, democratize and democratize democratize within the developing countries and democratize the international system by getting the majority to have a real voice at the table. Left side of the balcony. All right, that's it. Yeah, actually, uh, my name is Bayardo Gonzalez. I'm originally from Nicaragua, um, MPP2. My question is, you can't look at sort of Latin American development or a lot of the African development unless you look at politics and the political interests of either the United States or the Soviet Union, including a lot of Central Asia, obviously Eastern Europe. Uh, it seems that since the collapse of the Soviet Union, imperialism is a non-usable word or a bad word. My question is, what is the political interest of the United States now in development and of the European Union? Uh, as I said, I'm com I come from Nicaragua. You can't explain Nicaraguan development or Haitian development or most of Latin American development unless you look at the political interests of the United States. What is the political interest of the United States in development? Well, 
uh, not enough. <laughs> Let me uh, say what it should be. Uh, the U.S. is about 4.5% of the world's population right now. It will go down to something like 3% <coughs> by the year 2050. We better uh, use our moment of, uh, of glory to help shape an environment in which 3% of the world might feel comfortable. That's only going to be possible if the other 97% of the world are uh, also living uh, comfortably and stably. Marco. I'm Turkel Peterson. I'm a mid-career student here. Um, I think you have a very important epistemological point in your book and in other things you've written. And I think, for instance, your word reflexivity is being misunderstood. Um, you came up with these thoughts, I believe, when you studied under Karl Popper. And when I, wrote, uh, when I read about the, uh, the last book you came out with, you mentioned that you would propose ideas once you, at the time when you were a student in London and people wouldn't listen to you. It's very nice now to have $2 billion to help you, <laughs> and you can see how successful that is. Um, at the same time, I'm thinking that some of the points that you have at that epistemological level, which also challenge neoclassical economic assumptions, are very difficult to promote if you don't have $2 billion. So I was wondering if there's any chance that you could give just a little endowment that we could set up <laughs> a little research project here when I read Barbara Tuckman saying government has not been improved for 4,000 years, I have the impression that it, it can be done here. And I know you have a good uh, partner sitting next to you who would be very <laughs> glad to take... <laughs> to take a contribution, and I know at least somebody here who would like to participate in doing something about it. But I would like you perhaps to speak about the conflict between those ideas and not having $2 billion, how do we promote these thoughts? Uh, well, I think it's a, you touch actually a rather sensitive uh, <laughs> issue. <laughs> because uh, because uh, you know, I do get a hearing because of uh, my success uh, as, a, as a financier. And I really would like my ideas uh, to, be, to be judged on their merit and, and not on the wealth of their author. Uh, and so there's, there's always a problem. Uh, I mean, I don't feel it here at all, but I've had occasion when I was uh, given a, 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 a podium uh, in the hope of getting an endowment. Uh, and I, uh, <laughs> so I'm afraid that the fact that I've been invited here make, will make it, uh, make it much, harder for, much harder for Joe to get, a, get an endowment <laughs> from me. <laughs> so, I, we'll still criticize. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sergei Kasyanov, Ukraine, uh, Maskey Freedom Support Act program. Uh, George, in the beginning of the month, uh, our, we were visited by officer of Open Society Institute. I was asked, uh, uh, would I like to be a president of Ukraine? Uh, after thinking, I decided to agree. Uh, but will your uh, foundation support this program? Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, the foundation generally does not uh, support um, uh, presidential uh, candidates, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I admire, and, and, and actually Ukraine does need a good president. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on a few here. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> the balcony. Is, is there a question in the balcony? Otherwise, I'll go to the other. Mike on the floor, on the floor then. Stuart Berman, School of Public Health and the Centers for Disease Control. That notion about, well, I shouldn't say, the identification of malaria as an important, perhaps underlying obstacle to growth, I think was, was highlighted it's about four years ago. There was a World Bank report that, as I understood, was sort of uh, groundbreaking, acknowledging how important it is for improving health as a economic, as a tool to economic development. Um, what's happened with that report? Um, you know, has there been great changes in the flow of, of funds? Uh, the WHO can't be expected to do very much. They have almost no money. Uh, is there the potential for real change, for real dollars, uh, not, not an occasional grant that we sort of uh, dive after, but, but, but real wholesale kind of acknowledgement that this is an important uh, uh, kind of approach? You know, the world uh, did try a malaria uh, control and eradication effort uh, 
which uh, had some success in uh, southern Europe, southern US, uh, and a few other subtropical zones and was uh, not even started in sub-Saharan Africa. It collapsed in the early 1970s. U.S. interest uh, waned uh, in the 1980s, and for the last 15 years, there's been essentially zero. With the new uh, head of the World Health Organization, uh, Gru Brundtland, uh, a uh, graduate of the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, I'm uh, pleased to say, uh, there is a new launch of what the WHO is calling the Rollback Malaria Campaign. So this is another long-term effort to do something about a disease which kills uh, an estimated one to two million people a year and uh, causes a clinical uh, uh, deaths, uh, or I'm sorry, clinical uh, cases of about 800 million. What's amazing is we have no international mechanisms to finance this other than ad hoc donor support right now. And in a nutshell, the basic problem with the World Bank in doing this is that the bank is a bank. It makes loans. How do you make a loan for basic scientific research in malaria? You don't, so they don't. Uh, and uh, what they do is they make loans and then they try to use a little bit of the profits to do some good deeds. But we don't have financing for what economists call global public goods. We have George. Uh, but uh, that's uh, the, the, uh, the effort uh, for uh, malaria research uh, is a very big one. There are tw two thirds of the cases of AIDS right now uh, in the world are also in Africa for a region that is about 9% of the world's population. So there are disasters galore to work on. But instead, if you read any policy framework paper of the IMF and the World Bank, it's all about value-added tax reform and civil service reform and not about the underlying science that might be able to do something about this because there's no money in that. This will have to be the last question. My name is Holger Müller from the Kennedy School. Um, I would like to ask you, Mr. Soros, as an expert in the international financial system, do you think a Tobin tax would reduce speculation and contribute, contribute to a stabilization of the international financial system? Yes. You might I, say what the Tobin tax Tobin, is. To, the Tobin tax is, is, is a, a, uh, a surcharge on currency transactions, a, a, a fee on, on currency transactions. And I think that the, the idea is basically was very sound at the time when Tobin proposed it, and I was actually going to endorse it in my book. Uh, and then I looked into it further, and I found that it probably is not practical anymore with the development of, of, of the various derivatives and, and synthetic uh, contracts that have become so widespread. Because uh, if it's, it, it, because there would be it would be very difficult uh, uh, to enforce it. At the time when Tobin proposed, uh, the principle is right, uh, uh, but at the time when pro uh, Tobin proposed it, there were uh, uh, transactions in currencies. There were no derivatives options, uh, knockout options, swaps, uh, uh, what have you. And I think it would be very difficult now uh, to establish uh, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, to enforce uh, the, the Tobin tax because most of these, uh, very often these derivatives uh, are actually designed to circumvent uh, taxation. But if I, just a footnote on that, if I remember from the book, you do applaud the Chilean scheme of requiring a deposit of short-run capital yes. done by a national government. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, we are, are uh, fortunate to have had a a uh, wide-ranging view of the world and the problems of capitalism. And uh, I must say that we've only skimmed the surface of the interesting material that are in the book. You'll have to read the book, but we'll also have to invite George back again. So let me thank him and Danny and Jeff for getting us launched on a very good evening. I have some um, comments on your, on your uh, uh, national, national. Uh